One of the most shocking events in history is in regard to a boy called Emmett Till. He lived in the era right after segregation rules were lifted in America. Kama wewe ulikuwa a very good student of history, you must remember what segregation was. It was that system, sort of like a caste system between blacks and whites. It meant that they had to be separated. There was a walking path for blacks and a walking path for whites. There was uh, restaurants for white people and black people. Like everything had to be done separated, including schools, churches they went to. Churches had to either be black or white. Basically a very silly societal system. Of course, the people who thrived on this are racist. At this point, I have to mention that not all whites are racist. If anything, racists are very few compared to other whites because even when you think about slavery, the blacks would not have won that war had it not been for the whites who helped them, led by their iconic president, Abraham Lincoln. Chicago was one of those cities where blacks had freedom. Freedom that other blacks in other parts of America only dreamed of. Basically, life was better for blacks in this city than most cities. But of course, racism and segregation effects, they couldn't fade away instantly. All I'm saying is, Chicago was one of those places where blacks felt they belonged and they thrived. Emmett's mother was called Mamie Till and she was a widow having lost her husband who was a soldier in the Second World War. While in the field, he was executed on charges of having relations with white women. And this was another sad, ugly reality about the segregation and the racial era. The white man would kill to make sure that the black man would not have relations with the white woman. So many young black men suffered under that kind of system because if um, a black man is dating a white woman, which was death in itself, that's just like courting death. But in case a brave black man agreed to date a white woman and then the relationship was discovered, the woman would easily say that the black man raped her and the racist judges would believe that and the black person would be executed. There were also other situations where the white man would rape a white woman, but then to escape punishment, he would lie that a black man did it and then the black man would get executed or jailed for it. It was just a very bad era. Again, let's come back to Mimi and Emmett. Mimi, who was Emmett's mom, was working in a government office and she was earning pretty well for a black woman in that era and as such she was able to give Emmett a good life. Mimi's uncle Moose Wright lived in Mississippi and it's important to note that the southern part of America was the most racist part on earth at the time. The whites in this area were so gang ho at ensuring that slavery was retained that they even fought a civil war against Abraham Lincoln and the majority whites who wanted to declare freedom to the slaves. One day, Moose Wright visited Chicago, and after finishing whatever business he had in Chicago, Emmett begged the mom to allow him to accompany Moose to the south so that he could visit with his cousins. Of course, he had missed them. They sounded like they were very good friends. So, after a lot of begging, mom reluctantly agreed. And uh, Emmett went with another cousin. They were two cousins who left Chicago and then they went to Mississippi. Mimi warned her son and she told him Mississippi is not like Chicago. Here you are free, but in Mississippi it's not like that. The whites there are a different breed. Those guys are dangerous, so you don't look at them. You don't look at a white woman. You don't talk to a white woman. When you meet a white person, you either look away, look down, and give that person space to walk, or better still, cross to the other side of the road and let the white person pass. Basically treat them like a plague. So she warned uh, her son to do that. But of course, the kid is 14. The only life he has ever known is Chicago, whereby she sees black people being treated humanely. So this whole idea was not making sense. After all, he's 14 years old. He actually thought that mom was exaggerating. And during her interview, Mimi actually admitted that she was exaggerating. But she wanted Emmett to understand that the whites in the South were not normal whites. They were people who were so addicted to racism and they still believed in segregation and they were pretty angry whites who were just mad with life because uh, slavery had been abolished and they used to depend on it for economic purposes. I mean, they used to use the slaves to farm in their cotton fields. And now with um, no slavery, it meant labor was going to go up, it would become expensive to pay them, so on and so forth. So they were just bitter people. And not all of them again, just some of the race. So Emmett goes to Mississippi together with another one of his cousins and the cousins in Mississippi are so excited to see him. Emmett is described as 
that person who becomes the entertainer of a party he tends to be the center of attention and he's just he, he he's very entertaining so he had a lot of jokes he was witty he was naughty he was a great storyteller he was just this perfect 14 year old kid who would make everyone around him feel entertained so of course he's telling them stories about chicago you can just imagine a situation whereby you are from a city like mombasa kisumu nairobi and then you travel to ushago and you go and meet a kid who has never been to a big city so this kid will be asking you how is the city like things like those of course they'll be excited to hear those stories so that was the dynamic going on here and of course Emmett was also excited to go to the countryside he also used to enjoy the adventures there they'd go swimming they'd go fishing they'd go and uh, pick cotton during harvest time it was also fun for him a few days into his visit, one afternoon after him and his cousins had been picking cotton in the farm, they headed to the town center to buy some sweets. Maurice Wright, who was 16 years old, was the one who was driving the car. When they got to town, they proceeded to go and buy candy, which is what we call sweets here, in a particular shop owned by a couple called the Bryants. So the man was called Roy Bryant and the woman was called Carol Bryant. And the rule in that store was, I, I quite didn't understand, but they say that the rule was one person would enter at a time. So when the turn for Emmett arrived for him to enter, they knew this boy, he's from Chicago, he's very free-spirited, he can be a bit naughty. So while inside, Morris, who was the eldest of the team, instructed his younger brother, who is called Simon Wright, and told him, Abu, Abu just go in there to confirm that Emmett will not start being naughty. So Simon walked towards the store. Nothing much is known about what happened inside the store, but as Simon got to the door, that is when Emmett now was coming out, having bought his sweets. Emmett, in a naughty format, turned to that lady called Carol Bryant. The husband was not around, so she was the one who was selling. Emmett turned to her and whistled at her. Nile kupiga binji. Yes, he whistled at her. And everyone was shocked, including Simon Wright, including the woman, because this was not even supposed to happen in Mississippi. This is something that could get a black person killed. I'm imagining Simon just must have pulled Emmett by the hand and they went back to the car. During this time, Carol had also gotten so mad, she had actually come out of the store and headed to her car. So the boys assumed that probably she had gone to pick a gun. So they quickly entered the car and Morris drove out. Morris Wright, the brother to Simon, he drove off. So when they got to a safe distance, when they were sure no one was following them and everything, Emmett turned to his cousins and begged them not to tell their father what he had done because he was worried that if the father finds out, Emmett will be deported back to Chicago. The cousins agreed and a few days later, honestly, that thing quietened and they forgot about it. A few days later, say maybe three days after this incident, at two o'clock in the night, two white men came knocking on Wright's door. One of them was Roy Bryant and the other one was J.W. Milam. J.W. Milam was an uncle to Roy Bryant and Roy Bryant was a husband to Carol Bryant, the lady who Emmett had whistled to. So they came and demanded to talk to the Chicago boy. They didn't know that he was called Emmett. So they just came and said, we want to talk to the Chicago boy. And that is when Mose Wright and his wife learned of what Emmett had done a few days earlier. When they found out what Emmett had done, they knew his fate. So they started begging this man. They told them, Aki, we will give you money. Please don't leave this boy alone. I'm going to make sure that I put him on a, on a vehicle to go back to Chicago. Like they really begged, but the men insisted. They were like, we have to go with him. And they told him, if you don't give us Emmett, we will kill your family. You know, so with such a threat, they had no otherwise. Emmett was woken up, forced to wear his shoes, and then they left. From that moment, according to Simon, the last born of Mo's right, he says the mother never stopped crying. She she just continued crying. I think she even left. Like she was so grief stricken because she knew what was going to happen to Emmett. But now Mose had also requested them and told them, Aki, please don't kill him. So, so they promised. They said, No, 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 we're not gonna kill him, we're just gonna beat him and then we bring him back. So, of course, you can't sleep. One of you has been taken away in the middle of the night. So the family didn't sleep and they waited and they kept hoping that this man will bring Emmett back. Minutes turned to hours, night turned to day. And the moment morning reached, they realized that Emmett will not be brought back. And that's when they began searching for Emmett. And they started checking the places where black people used to check when one of them goes missing. Because lynching was a normal thing in the southern part of America. So they started looking, but they couldn't find him. And uh, by now... Now they had already informed the mom what had happened so the mom also knew that Emmett had been taken but now of course the mom was just praying and hoping that her son will come back safe and sound a few days later a man was at the river I don't know if he was fishing or just walking by he was at the river and then he saw a body floating and when the police picked the body they soon identified it as Emmett Till but he was so badly beaten 
that the only way they were able to identify him was through the ring the mother gave him, the ring that was uh, that belonged to his father. Mose made the difficult call to his mother, and since racist Mississippi didn't want the world to know what scam racists had done to a black kid of 14 years old, the equivalent of an OCPD there organized a quick burial, and when Emmett learned that her son was going to be buried in her absence, in another state, she did what she could do and managed to halt the burial. She also demanded that the body be flown back to Chicago, and she organized for that transportation. When the body arrived, the coroner had been instructed not to allow anyone to open it. Those were the instructions coming from Mississippi. So the mom wondered, uh, why can't I see my son? And on that note, she demanded. She told the coroner, if you don't open this box, I'm going to open it myself. And so finally, the body was opened. And to be honest, I can't describe the state of that body. So let me allow Mimi Till to describe it. I saw that his tongue was choked out. I noticed that the right eye was lying on midway his cheek. I noticed that his nose had been broken like somebody took a meat chopper and chopped his nose in several places. As I kept looking, I saw a hole, which I presumed was a bullet hole. And I could look through that hole and see daylight on the other side. And I wondered, was it necessary to shoot it? Mamie's 14-year-old boy was lynched in the most grotesque way all because he whistled at a white woman. Can you imagine? Just the naughty uh, activity of a 14-year-old caused him to be mutilated to a point that no one could even recognize him. That sounds bad, right? Well, it's about to get worse. But before it does, let me just tell you what this brave mother did. Mimi made a decision and decided that even though it was very hard for a mother to expose her son, Mimi decided to have an open casket where she would allow the world to see what happened to her son because according to her, words could not describe what these two men had done to her son. The story spread like bushfire and before long, the whole world saw what had happened to poor Emmett Till, who was only 14 years old, all because he was black. The incident shook the nation, both white and black Americans. For the whites, they were shocked that lynching still used to happen. You know, it was that thing of, like nowadays, the way blacks were getting shot in America and uh, the whites were not realizing it until people started filming it. So this was the same situation. In the South, lynching was going on, but no one was talking about it because no one ever brought it to the fore. And that is where Mimi said, I'm going to be different. I'm going to make sure people see what has happened to my son. So that was a shock on white America. At the same time, for black Americans, the incident pinched at their conscience. The mother of Emmy Till told them that no one was safe. If racists could come after a 14-year-old, no one was safe. News spread in Europe and the rest of America and suddenly Mississippi was front news for all the wrong reasons. Now, I told you the story was about to get worse and this is why. After the murder occurred, Roy Bryant and uh, J.W. Milam were arrested. And so a trial was set after the funeral. Just before the trial, the whites teamed up together because the Americans of the South did not understand what the big deal is. They didn't believe that black lives matter. So they were like, okay, what's the big deal? We kill them all the time. So why are you even making noise about it? So they didn't understand. They felt offended that these two white men were being put on trial because of killing a black kid. So they went around collected money in jazz and hired the best lawyers and all the white lawyers in the southern part of America in Mississippi came together they were like I, I can't remember how many they were but they came together to represent them the trial was set for the two men and when it started the racist lawyers even claimed that the black political movement called NAACP had hidden Emmett Till somewhere and then picked a random body and that is a body that was buried like literally these lawyers were saying this was not Emmett Till and yet Emmett Till was quite identifiable because of the clothes he was wearing and also the ring but no one cared at that time also to save her husband and her husband's uncle carol bryant the woman whom emmett whistled to lied that emmett had physically assaulted her she died recently and before she did she admitted that she had lied to make sure that the killers did not serve time for the death of emmett at this point, black Americans were boiling with rage. FBI and the sitting president showed zero concern and no one was interested in seeing justice for Emmett. After the 
case was concluded. The killers were so arrogant, they even did a tell-all interview with a magazine called Look Magazine, where they explained how they beat Emmett and completely destroyed his face before shooting him in the head. They then threw him into the Tallahatchie River, where his body was later recovered. Emmett's death and how white Mississippi mishandled the trial launched the civil rights movement amongst blacks in America because a hundred days after this tragic incident, Rosa Parks, that popular lady called Rosa Parks, she refused to give her seat to her white man and her arrest set off the Montgomery bus boycott and since then the human rights movement continues. Yeah, that was another interesting story, just look it up, the Montgomery bus boycott. Like, in the buses they even had sections for white people, at least due white people were supposed to sit at the front, then the black people were supposed to sit at the back, but in case the front area filled up, then the blacks were supposed to wake up from where they were seated and allow the white men to sit. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So, when uh, this incident happened, Rosa Parks, a black woman, she said she will not stand up for a white person and she refused. And then she was arrested and then a whole other civil rights movement started off from there. So, my point is, Emmett Till is the one who triggered all this. He made black Americans and white Americans who believed in freedom to come together and fight these racists, especially the ones who are found in the southern states of America. Yes, the lives of black people in America are still threatened by a few racist people like Derek Chauvin, but generally their lives are better now because of Mamie Till. She said she will not bear the burden of her son's death alone, and as such she allowed the world to see the mutilated body of her son. And this brave move caused blacks in America and the many whites who recognize the black people as equals to fight for their rights. Of course, the senseless murders of George Floyd remind us that the fight is far from over, but Emmett Till was that sacrificial lamp that launched the civil rights movement. I will never understand how Mamie Till survived the tragedy, but she says that one day while praying, God spoke to her and told her that her son's job was to help free black people. That Emmett was a gift to her and she was supposed to be gifted to her for only 14 years, but his role, job on this world, was to set off the civil rights movement. And his murder, his death, did that perfectly. To those wondering, did the man who killed the poor boy pay? The American justice system may have failed the Till family, but karma came knocking. The white racists from Mississippi were so upset with the killers that even though they helped them get off with murder, they excommunicated them. I don't think they were angry because these white people killed a black boy. No, I don't think that was the issue. I think the issue was you killed a boy and you got caught because this is something they were doing over and over again. So anyway, these two men were excommunicated and the Bryant family will always go down in history as a family of people who instigated a racial murder against a 14-year-old kid. That is not easy on someone's conscience, even to the fourth generation. At the same time, blacks who were majority customers at the Bryant shop boycotted it and a few weeks later the shop was closed. Also, the Emmett drama strained the couple to a point that they eventually divorced. One time, Mamie overheard Roy Bryant say that Emmett's death had ruined his life, but he never apologized for what he did. But the fact that it ruined it, for me, makes me smile a little bit. It is also said that the killers never recovered socially or financially, and they continued to live in poverty, especially when the shop was closed. Another thing, which is not a good thing, but I think it also made Carol realize what she had done, she actually lost her son. I know, I feel sorry for her, and that was not a good thing, but at least she was able to experience the feeling of loss. Of course, it's nothing compared to what happened to Emmett because Emmett's life was stolen as opposed to her kid who, I think, fell sick or something. But at least she got to feel 10% of what Mamie Till felt. On the other hand, Mamie got so much support and recognition in America and beyond that with the loss of her only biological son, she gained more children because after that she graduated as a teacher and began teaching and participated in a lot of public speaking engagements whereby she used to talk about civil rights and the death of her son. Also, I might not know much, but I'm sure that from the moment Mamie involved the world into her grief, from the moment she allowed people to work with her in her painful journey, I'm sure she never experienced a lonely moment in her life. Yes, she missed her son, but she got a chance to interact and get to widen her scope of friends because people were really supportive to her. She also got paid well from her talking engagements. I know nothing can bring back her son, but the support she received from the black community and white America, I'm sure it gave her a bit of comfort. She rested in 2003, and hopefully she is now reunited with her beloved son. Indeed, Mamie's pain united a nation. Rest well, Emmett. Your sacrifice was untimely, but it changed the world forever.
And that's all for today. I'm Faith. Stay safe.